I've played quite unreasonable amounts of Elden Ring these last months, especially for someone who supposedly has a family and a day job. And one of the things I've been enamored by constantly is just how much you can miss in this game. At times, Elden Ring feels almost indifferent about your existence. From Software's contemporary games have always been in a kind of weird dialogue with their player base. The law, best practices, mechanics, secrets, hidden messages and optimal routes stir questions and heated arguments online that often end in either mutual appreciation of the series' attributes or remarks of the circumference of your mama's behind and her assumed taste for raunchy, well-endowed sailors. But one thing everyone seems to agree on is on your first playthrough you should go into the game blind. The confusion, the anger, the exaltation, the unyielding need to bang your head against a hard surface are all hallmarks of the authentic Soulsborne experience. Life-altering suffering is par for cause with these games. Later, much later, after the blind playthrough, then comes the time for min-maxing, completionist runs, optimizing builds, revenge chores and trying out best ways to make the game your bitch. But first, you should suffer, confused and not knowing any better. That is the way. From Software seems to focus more into the communal aspects of these games with each subsequent release, which is a fancy way of saying they are getting more obtuse every new release. No matter how in tune I get with these games, how well I learn their weird idiosyncrasies and get into their peculiar flow, the latter games still seem to be getting more obtuse -er ish Yeah, Dark Souls has some cryptic quest lines that are easy to break. Just loiter around without first doing something else somewhere. The quests can be hard to finish even when you know what you're supposed to do and where you should do it. And the subsequent games just escalate the madness further. By Dark Souls 3 and Sekiro, we are hopping through rings and fetch quests so obscure and tangential it borders on an act of God someone ever managed to complete these things without consulting a walkthrough first. But Elden Ring takes it a step further, a couple of steps even. It seems to assume you're going through the game as a part of some sort of collective, that you are asking friends, searching for guidance, looking for answers online. I remember getting stuck in Castlevania 2, Simon's quest for the NES. Yes, I am that old. There was this dead end at the end of the game world, behind a perilous road and a great deal of annoying platforming. The reward for my tribulations was this great monolith of halted progress. I couldn't figure out where to go, what to do and how to progress. For years, this was the end point of Simon's quest for me. The great adversary who halted my adventure was not death no Dracula. It was this goddamn slab of a mountain. Years later, I found out how you're supposed to progress. You're supposed to equip this unassuming item and go sit in the corner of the screen. After an inordinate amount of waiting, a whirlwind will arrive to whisk you into the next area of the game. Granted, From Software isn't as trigger happy about these things as Konami in their glory days, but they are still the best in the biz when it comes to hiding intriguing content from the average gamer. It would have been interesting to be a part of the launch day battalion, the D Day offense against the lands between. How the hell did those poor bastards figure any of this stuff out? I'll never know. How did they realize the other half of this key to this grand lift is located in a small hidden village of the beaten path on the other side of the freaking world, held by an NPC who's disguised himself as a pot? Really, a goddamn pot. And somehow you're supposed to just know to whack him so he'll reveal himself to you and handle his half of the medallion. 
How did they find out at the bottom of this optional, easy to miss area, there's a hidden boss fight? And behind this boss chamber, there are not one, but two hidden passageways, which lead to a finicky platforming section, after which you find yourself staring at a door that cannot be opened. Or, more accurately, good luck opening this door without consulting a wiki. Also, on this floor, there's a third hidden wall that leads you to another huge hidden area. Oh, and in this easy to miss sewer, you can find a NPC whose questline can unlock a new ending to the game. So let's recap. At the bottom of this unassuming well, there are four optional areas, which can lead to three different game endings, three secret passages, one secret boss fight, buried here for someone to stumble on. I can't shake the feeling when playing these games that, once again, I'm supposed to just sit in a corner and wait for a Doisex Machina to whisk me into some unknown, intriguing segment of the game. By this point, I guess From Software just assumes their fanbase consists of devoted members who go through the game hitting every possible vertical surface in search of hidden secrets and treasures. And I guess they are more or less correct in that assumption. I've seen religious institutes with less fervorous members, less eager to suffer for hidden knowledge of the world. The world of Elden Ring is gargantuan. It starts off feeling that way, but then it just expands and expands into every direction as you go on. Liurnia, Kaelid, Altus Plateaus, the weeping Peninsula, the mountain ranges, the capital of Leyendel, the crumbling Faro Mazula, and then there's the eternal underground cities and their hidden nooks, crannies and rivers, the lake of rot, the halic tree, the deep root depths. The lands between is just ridiculously large. Elden Ring has over 230 boss encounters, 56 dungeons, all of which are optional, 36 NPC quest lines, and 6 different endings. Now, these readings might not seem that substantial. Most of contemporary open world games provide similar numbers, if not greater. Dozens upon dozens of hours of content, endless seeming lists of quest logs, treasure maps, side activities, scavenger hunts, bandit camps, and other points of interest. All of those hundreds of markers on the map just waiting to be explored and unraveled to keep you engaged when you lose your interest in the main campaign. But here's the thing. Elden Ring doesn't have map markers, no quest logs, not one. And the optional content, that's more or less the entire game. Kaelid, you don't have to go here. This boss, you don't have to fight him. This huge area covering one-fourth of the game world, you can just ride through it and press on. Compared to its contemporaries, From Software is almost violently indifferent about the crushing FOMO of the avid gamer. Elden Ring just kicks you out of the starting dungeon, out into the blinding light, and says, Go. Here's what you're required to do in order to beat Elden Ring. Gather to any of the two available eight great runes. Go to the city of Leyndel and confront Godfrey and kill Margot. Go to the Grand Lift of Rold and get to the mountaintops of Giants. Kill the Fire Giant and burn the Earth Tree. Go to Farumazula and kill the Godskin Apostles and Malakith. Return to Leyndel, kill Godfrey, Radagon and the Elden Beast. That's not a lot of steps for a game which normal first playthrough ranges from 100 to 150 hours. This is a hyperbole, of course. Most of the players do see much of the world, even on their first playthrough. First, because you have no idea you're supposed to do any of the things I said earlier, not to mention how to do them, so you'll just end up stumbling around the world from one curio to another. 
Which leads us to the second point. Most of those curios will kill you. This world is out to get you, and unless you spend your days exploring and looting around, you won't manage to accomplish any of the necessary steps to move forward. So yeah, it's a hyperbole, but it's an interesting one. As From Software's push for player agency, game after game after game, has reached quite grand proportions. Because now, instead of a couple of small, intriguing yet optional areas, the entirety of the world is more or less optional. I'm having a hard time not seeing this as a distillation of sorts, a sharpening of intent. These games have always rewarded tenacity and intent, curiosity. FromSoft's games are really difficult, pun intended, to stumble through casually. They demand their pound of flesh if you wish to see them through. Mastery isn't always required, but paying attention is. If you hearken enough to what the game and its world are telling you, more often than not you're rewarded in spectacular ways. This time the developers just went all the way and ran beyond the horizon with this idea. In my experience, it might not always be the best moments that lay hidden within these worlds, but often they are the most interesting ones. In Dark Souls 1, there's a crow's nest hidden atop the ruins of the Firelink Shrine, accessible through a couple of finicky, well-timed rolls. Make it to the top of the ruin and the nest, and you are greeted with a prompt. Curl up into a ball. If you hang around curled up into a ball for around 20 seconds or so, the mother crow will arrive and carry you back to the Northern Undead Asylum, the tutorial level of the game. Here, some interesting loot and a couple of optional encounters await. But the most important thing in the Northern Asylum is the key item, the Peculiar Doll. If you make your way all the way to Anor Londo, probably the farthest point possible in the game world, you can open a way to another hidden area. Approach the giant painting in the Great Hall while holding the doll, and you can enter the painted world of Ariamis, a cold, snowy fortress with some nice loot and an interesting boss fight as a reward for your curiosity. At the bottom of Blight Town, in the middle of the poisonous swamp, there lays a hollow tree trunk. Within it, a small room and a chest. Behind this chest is a hidden passage that leads to a dead end. But behind this dead end is another hidden pathway. This pathway leads you into the Great Hollow, and a misery-filled trek down to the branches of the Great Tree, which are home to one of the most annoying enemies in video game history. Make it through the branches and you're rewarded with a giant mushroom man who one-punch mans you to death provided the chance. But after him... The Ash Lake, an ethereal plain of ashen shores, unending waters and ash trees. The trees rise from the waters high, high above the skyline, into the other worlds and beyond. Tens, hundreds, as far as the eye can see. There's also music, a rare occurrence in Dark Souls. And what kind of music? At the end of the shoreline, hidden inside another great hollow tree, you're met with an ancient, eternal dragon. What the hell is this place? Now, the Northern Asylum and the Painted World are one thing. Little pieces of extra content, self-contained dungeons with some nice loot and EXP, a couple of optional bosses and hidden of the well-beaten path. But the Ash Lake is something different. It's vast, near limitless, empty. There are arch trees. It has music. There's a goddamn dragon in here. A being that's supposed to very much not exist. The dragons lived in the Age of Grey, the cosmogonical stillness before the Age of Fire, before disparity, the Lords, the First Flame, and the Dark Soul of Man. The Ash Lake changes things, it rewrites and challenges the cosmology we are provided with at the beginning of the game, and here it waits, hidden behind a couple of secret walls, never to be seen by the majority of the casual player base. Perhaps the reason 
In Bloodborne, there is an elevator in Odin Chapel, which takes you up into the Healing Church workshop. If you fight your way up, you'll find a locked door on top of the tower. Behind the door lays Upper Cathedral Ward, the base of operation for the choir, an elite faction of the Healing Church whom are responsible for the outbreak of the beastly scourge. The choir sought to uncover the mysteries of the universe through communion with the Great Ones, but their sacred purpose was to accelerate the evolution of mankind into a higher state of being. The sky and the cosmos are one, hold their adage, and to some no means were deemed too extreme or immoral in pursuit of this goal. Fighting through beast and kin, we reach the altar of despair, and in front of it we find Ebriatus, the daughter of Cosmos, the left behind great one. She is one of the most important characters of the story, yet here Ebriatus waits for us. Hidden behind locked doors and optional areas, tucked behind elevators and missing keys, here she rests dormant and laments in front of an altar, hidden within the highest peak of Yarnum, ever doomed to watch from afar the sky and the cosmos, reminiscing of her kin that ascended untold eons ago. Here only she remains. Fromsoft hid her here because if you go around the tower, you're met with a chasm and a bunch of broken walkways. At the bottom of this crumbled tower lays a secret entrance to the cathedral ward. But if you don't chart your course to the bottom, but land instead on this unassuming beam here, But if you don't chart your course to the bottom but land instead on this unassuming beam here, you can drop off onto this tiny platform and exit the tower through the hidden door. Behind the door you'll find a pathway to the abandoned hunter's workshop, the one hunter's dream the game's hub world is built upon. Bloodborne's world is weird, filled with layers of different realities, nightmares and dreams which entwine and bleed into each other. The reasons why this place matters for the story of Bloodborne are too lengthy and complicated for the scope of this video, but in short, this place is a big deal. And it also houses a piece of one third of an umbilical cord, a rare item needed to reach the ultimate ending of the game, and here it just lays on the table inside this forsaken old workshop, buried by time and dust, hidden within a wall and a secret door, as if to in the forgotten woods, there is a cavern hidden deep within the mountain. Through the cavern, across the poisonous swamp, you can find a pair of ladders. A pair of ladders so long, they'd make even Hideo Kojima proud. These ladders, deep within the mountain, lead you... ...back to where you started your nightmarish journey, the front yard of Josefka's clinic. From the back alley, you can climb inside the clinic and witness yourself what the choir has been up to here. If you come here after the blood moon has risen, you can receive another one-third of a new umbilical cord, the rare substance to call communion with the Great One. It's impossible to reach the final ending of the game if you don't visit at least the clinic or the abandoned workshop. You need three umbilical cords to beckon the final boss of the game, the unnamed Moon Presence. For one reason or another, Fromsoft decided to hide these moments, resolutions and revelations within these small buildings behind pathless ways and roads less traveled, so the player might experience Of course, From Software isn't the only developer around with easy to miss yet essential moments in their games. In the penultimate stretch of Disco Elysium, You've met with a miracle, an insolidian phasmid, an enormous reed-like insect. The phasmid has been a red herring sort of joke throughout the game, a silly side quest where you run around Martinez and check baits left around by the cryptozoologist couple you met in the bar. It's quite clear from the start, the thing doesn't actually exist. The search of the phasmid was just a shared dream of an old married couple. But lo and behold, here it is alive and very much real for all to see. Now, most of Disco Elysium's most interesting content is optional and quite easy to miss. The constant dice rolls, allocated stats and the way DE's dialogue system works make it nigh on impossible for two playthroughs to be identical, even if you engage with the same quests and content. 
Disco Elysium is absolute, all-encompassing madness by its nature, and could fill the entirety of this video. But the encounter with the Phasmid isn't optional. If you get this far, you will see it. And thank God for that, since it's one of the most beautiful and heartfelt scenes I've ever seen. Solving the main murder plot acts as a thematic close for the city of Revachol, its history, and the shard-like socio-political legacy we've dragged ourselves through the whole game. It isn't a triumphant affair, but a tired, sad scene which underlines our incapacity to move on and learn from our mistakes. But the Phasmid is something else. It brings to a close our character's arc, and it ends in an invitation to some good old honest-to-god redemption. Right here, right now, for this brief while, Harry is whole. Against all odds, he has solved the case and made it up this far. And despite all the horrors of life, even if just for a moment, the world is filled with luminous beauty that can redeem everything and everyone, even someone as horribly flawed as him. This is the moment where Harry can finally grant himself some forgiveness and move on in his life with newfound resolve. This heartfelt scene is also, by design, missable. You need to roll two skill checks to interact with the Insulidian Phasmid. Inland Empire is your ability to sense or imagine hidden secrets of the cosmos. Fail the check and you won't be able to communicate with the creature. You'll just stare at each other in the beautiful sunset, accompanied by some incredible music. Fail the electrochemistry check and the creature will just run away when you approach it. It vanishes into the reeds and takes with it all the redemptive words, all its world-healing wisdom. It's baffling to think many people will go through this game and miss this redemptive scene, thanks to some bad luck and unwitting stat allocations. This heartfelt moment that ties it all together. I don't know, maybe there is some allegory hidden here about the hidden nature One of my favorite scenes of ever is found in Konami's Suikoden 2 for the original PlayStation. But in order for you to appreciate the scene, we need to set up some backstory. So buckle up and gather round, for I'm about to spoil Suikoden 2 for you. The story begins in the campsites of the Unicorn Youth Brigade, a mix of military regime and boy scouts. A place where the fine, able youth of Highland can learn the ropes of warfare. The camp is attacked in the darkness of the night. During your daring escape, you and your BFF Joey find out the attack is a false flag operation carried out by Highland Zone White Wolf Brigade, an elite military group led by the Prince of Highland himself. The White Wolves, with Prince Luca Blight at the helm, slaughter the whole Unicorn Brigade in order to incite war against the neighboring city-states of Jouston. Your escape is detected and a chase ensues up an old mountain path. The windy road leads next to a cliffside. Before a daring jump down to the waters below, you make an oath to each other and carve it into the silent stone wall of the mountain. Should we ever get separated, this is where we'll return find each other again. You jump, survive, and manage to escape. You're declared as traitors to the Empire, filthy spies who led a city-state ambush against the Youth Brigade. Your family and community disowns you, and you're forced into exile. With nothing left, starts your long and tragic journey into the heart of the Rebellion as a great champion against the tyranny of Highland. About one-third into the story, you and Joey happen upon an old cave where you are granted with the two halves of the true rune of beginning, the bright shield and the black sword. It's this whole magical law, destiny, fate thing. Just go with it, you know. From this moment on, both of your fates are entwined with these runes. Joey is captured during a siege, yet manages to escape through the use of off-screen shenanigans. The joyful reunion is cut short by an abrupt tragedy. Joey stabs to death a prominent city-state leader and flees the murder scene. He escapes the city and the rest of your crew is left dismayed and confused. Joey isn't simply a traitor who changed his allegiance and crawled back to the Empire that cast him aside. Joey switches side because... 
He loves Highland. He wishes to end the corruption, to end the war, to overthrow the mad prince who is sowing death and strife everywhere around him. The Empire of Highland must return to its picturesque state, like it was in the good old days. Perhaps that state has ever existed in the mind of a naive child. But his plan works. Throughout the story, Joey rises through the ranks of the Highland military. He becomes a captain, a general, a fierce tactician and trusted leader of the public. By the penultimate climax of the story, Joey has made himself the king consort of Highland. Now he can reforge the Empire into something better than the war-torn husk it is now. But the chasm between the two nations has grown too deep, and when an opportunity presents itself, their city-state alliance launches a full-scale campaign against Lenoir, the capital of Highland. The city is sacked. One by one, the heroes of Empire fall before you, all willing to die for their new just king, Joey Blight. But when you reach the throne room, you're not met with Joey. The king has fled the city. You do battle against a giant magical wolf thingy, because it's a JRPG. Of course you do. After the beast is felled, the city is yours. The kingdom of Highland lays in ruins, and the short-lived monarchy of King Joey Blight is brought to an end. Now all that remains is to declare the independence of the newfound Dunan Republic. The story ends as you accept your duties as a guardian of this new nation, and vow to guide it towards a bright future with all your best intentions and abilities. Roll credits. Or not. You may turn down this invitation to rule and power, walk away from the meeting, abandon your post and responsibilities, disheartened by all the tragedy and loss this war has brought you. You may wander in the lands alone, unaccompanied by your party of five chosen warriors, the entourage you've grown accustomed during this long journey. Throughout the game, the Kingdom of Highland, a significant part of the map, has been inaccessible to you. Now, at the end of everything, as the Empire has been ground to dust underneath your campaign, you're free to wander and explore this fallen kingdom alone. If you visit the area where the Unicorn Brigade massacre took place, you can make your way up to the cliffside from where you took your leap of faith. From there, you can find the mark you carved on the mountainside. And there, by the cliffside, Joey is waiting for you. One last duel the champion of the Dunan Republic against the King of Highland, the bright shield against the black sword. The bearers of the runes of beginning are destined to face each other till one or the other falls. No one can escape fate. This scene can play out in multiple ways based on your choices. But here's my favorite one. Joey attacks you, but you refuse to fight him. Time after time he hits you, you evade. He strikes, you block. The sun sets behind you. Joey begs you to fight, to put an end to the Blight bloodline and make this the last war to ever plague this land. But you can't do it. No matter how honorable his intentions are, you can't raise your arms against Joey. He attacks you again and again until he's too weak to carry on anymore. He collapses to your arms, and only then you realize the toll the Black Sword rune has taken on his body. Joey used its power again and again throughout the war, and now it has all but devoured him. And then, after a few tender words, Joey dies in your arms, and this story comes to a close. Perhaps the developers at Konami wanted to make this scene optional, Which brings us back a full circle into the beginning of this video, to Elden Ring. Because inside that easy-to-miss area, behind a couple of hidden pathways and an invisible door, there is a hidden moment worthy to stand shoulder to shoulder with the other greats.
The nomadic merchants are a common sight around the waypoints of Elden Ring. Helpful people are a rarity in the lands between, and these merchants are one of the few who bear no ill will, no ulterior motives. They merely try to fight off starvation and despair in the ways their tribe has done since time immemorial, selling items, wares and information to the tarnished and other misfortuned who venture back and forth the lands between. Most of the merchants reside near Signs of Grace and thus, little by little, their presence leaves its itch into your memory. Rest is near, the warmth of a safe bonfire is just ahead. Some of them even play music with their weird instruments. A beautiful, mournful melody of their people, a song about sorrows of times long gone. The world of Elden Ring is relentless, so you come to treasure these small reprieves. You. The merchant, the bonfire, the stillness of the night, and this beautiful song. Once, long ago, the merchants travelled as a great caravan from land to land, city to city, until one day they fell under the ire of the Golden Order. Ill words spread in the lands between of the disease and strife the caravan brought with them. Where they went, calamity followed, according to gossip at least. Rumors, lies, none know for sure, told the merchants prayed to a blasphemous madness that sought to defile the Golden Grace. The Order would not let this type of slander pass. So, inside Leindel, the hallowed capital of the Golden Order, you might come across an entrance to the sewers. Be prepared for bad times ahead here. From the sewers, you can enter the subterranean shunning grounds, a prison for all those who were not touched by the grace, who did not meet the criteria of the Golden Order. Here, underneath the sewers of the Golden City, they would lead their lives, never to see the light of day. At the bottom of the shunning grounds is the chamber of Mo, the Omen, a sire of the demigods, who was nonetheless banished here to hide his hideous visage from the world. But beyond Mo's chamber, there is an illusory wall, and behind that, another hidden pathway. Inside, a miserable sight awaits. Perhaps the Golden Order listened to the rumors from all around the lands between. They waited until one day the great caravan arrived to Leyendil, which greeted them with open arms and laurel-laden roads. And when the last of the carriages had crossed the great walls of the city, they barred the gates and got to work. Here, Underneath the roads, sewers, and the shunning grounds is where the caravan was cast, sealed into darkness for their alleged blasphemy. Amidst the endless pile of corpses, only one nomad remains, crippled by time and despair. He sits in silence and plays a mournful song, the ancient song of his people. At the bottom of this giant crypt, stories and stories down, is a sealed door, only few in this world know how to open, and behind these doors lays in wait the three fingers, the advocates of the frenzied flame, the profane fire that seeks to burn this tired, corrupt world to the ground. Maybe a new, a better one could rise from the ashes. Perhaps the nomads, met with such undeserved spite and cruelty, gathered all their hatred into a prayer, into a song. In their tomb they howled, cursed and screamed, Days, weeks, years. One by one, the voices died out, but someone heard their cries. The flaming madness answered their call and made this tomb its home. With the great caravan now destroyed, the remaining nomads lead a life of solitude. They learned their lesson of what could happen should they bond together. Yet each one of them remembers and carries on the legacy of the great caravan, a yellow burning hue in their eyes, the mark of the all-cleansing madness of the frenzied flame. It's almost effortless to walk past this little story, past all these stories. Fix your gaze into the highest, furthest point in the horizon and just march on. And why not? We're busy people with busy lives shit to do and responsibilities to handle. There's quests to complete, 
chose to finish and checklist to cross. And this goddamn journey is long enough as is, without piling on any extra detours. I get it. You're busy. I'm busy. Everyone's busy. Death comes to us all and in the end the gaping grave awaits. Might as well get busy before that. Now I don't know the explicit reasons why these stories were made optional, why the devs felt the need to obscure that particular pathway, and I've made an effort to steer away from that question this whole video. Not because I don't know the answer, but because I don't think it really matters. It's a grand part of what makes these stories special, and I'm happy to leave it at that. If finitude is what gives life its meaning, maybe the same thing applies to stories, to art, relationships, to any experience you place value on. You could have just as easily walked past that one gallery, grabbed a different book from the endless row of books, not take that one job and end up not meeting your future wife, grabbed the controller and played something different, bared witness to a different story. It could have been so effortless to walk past all those moments, to just march on with your eyes fixed on the next map marker, and after that, another map marker awaits. So many goddamn map markers. Now, I don't want to get too sappy on you this close to the finish line. We made it almost to the end of the video, without turning this on to some think piece about the fleeting nature of life or something similar. Sometimes, you know, you just want to talk about video games. But still, you know, there's something here. Something pivotal. Perhaps it's something as simple as this. It bears me well to be reminded from time to time that the most interesting stories, the most heartfelt moments and the revelations of utmost importance are seldom found along the already beaten path. Thanks for watching.